Restore first things first in my life. <clears throat> you know, and there, there are so many things that command our attention in this life. I remember as a boy, my dad telling me about all the things that I had that he didn't have that, you know, I could do and I could play with and, and I could have fun with. And then I find myself reflecting back on my life and it seems like it's just exploded exponentially as far as the things that we have to distract us. Not bad things. They're good things. They're entertaining things. They're, they're enjoyable things. But there's more and more things every day that we have to make uh, or, or to confuse or to upend our priorities. I should be working, but I've got a solitaire game on my computer. I, I should be spending time with my family, but there's Facebook and Instagram and social, uh, other types of social media. I should be doing the Lord's work, but there's football and there's basketball and there's hunting and there's fishing and there's all sorts of school activities. There's all these things that compete for our time and for our attention. And it's so easy to be distracted. I was uh, watching the news, which I do a lot less than I used to, but I had it on the other day, and they were, there was an interview. <clears throat> Pardon me, brethren, I'm having a little bit of trouble with my voice this morning. Um, there was an interview with one of the co-founders of Facebook, and I forget his name. It wasn't uh, Mr. Zuckerberg. It was um, uh, his partner. But he was... In the interview, he was telling about how when they were creating the concept of Facebook, that they intentionally made it as addictive as they possibly could. And I don't mind a person who's trying to sell a product, trying to do things to make people want to use the product, as long as it's within common sense and, and, and good reason. But he was talking about how they wanted people to pick up Facebook, so to speak, on their computer or whatever it was, and not be able to put it down. And then when they did put it down, not be able to think about anything else until they went back to it and picked it back up again. And I thought to myself, you know, that's a guy who's really figured out how to distract people from doing a lot of things. I don't think Facebook is bad in and of itself, but you know what? Facebook keeps us from doing a lot of things maybe that we should be doing at, at, at other times, like work, like spending time with family, like uh, spending time with God. If you look in Matthew chapter 19, <clears throat> you see a man whose priorities were not straight. They weren't what they needed to be. In Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse 16, says, someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good things shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There's only one who is good, but if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbors yourself. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? Jesus said to him, If you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. You see, there was a man who was distracted. There was a man who didn't have his priorities straight in his life. He wanted to serve Jesus only as far as it didn't interfere with his possessions. He was happy to do all the other commandments, but when it came to selling his possessions, when it came to putting Jesus a number one first place in his life, he didn't want to do it. And so what do we do in this world that we live in, which is full of so many distractions, which are good in and of themselves, which are fun to engage in, which... Uh, may build camaraderie or relieve stress or a number of other things. How do we restore first things first in our life? Well, first of all, brethren, we need to restore our individual personal relationship with Jesus Christ. 
If we don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then we need to drop everything else that we're doing right now and fix it. Am I a Christian? That should be the first question we ask. Am I a Christian? Uh, Brother Lockhart did a, just a wonderful job on, uh, in his lesson in the worship hour on the church. and You know, in Ephesians 5 and verse 23, which he talked about, Paul says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. Jesus is going to save one body, and that's his body. And what is his body? Well, going back to Ephesians 1, verses 22 and 23, his body is the church. And if I'm not a Christian, then I'm not a part of his church. I'm not a part of his body, and he's not going to save me. And if that's the case, if I'm not a Christian, there, is, there should be no greater priority in my life than to be a Christian. Amen. You know, barring the second coming of Christ and maybe some other things, the way the NFL's going uh, right now, but if I don't watch a football game today, there's one on next week, right? Presumably. But you see... I'm not a Christian, that has eternal implications. I may not get a second chance for that. What is, well, before we get into that, Jesus says in Matthew 16 and verse 26, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his, for his soul? What on judgment day can, when, when I'm standing before God and he's saying, your soul is lost, what can I offer God to reclaim that soul? Nothing. And so what is a Christian? Well, to uh, re-preach Brother Lockhart's sermon uh, a little bit right now. Uh, a Christian is somebody who's repented of their sins and been baptized. Acts 2 and verse 38. Peter says pretty clearly, repent. Let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. A Christian is someone who's repented of their sins and been baptized and, have been, and has been forgiven of those sins. You go down three more verses and you see a Christian someone who's been added to the church. So then as many as received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. 3,000 people who heard Peter preach on that day said, you know what, we want to obey what God uh, is going to tell us to do. And when they did, God added them to his church. And we find in verse 47 of Acts chapter 2 that the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So a Christian is somebody who is saved. And this corresponds, doesn't it, with Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, and Ephesians 5, verse 23, that we just looked at. And so if you haven't repented of your sins, if you haven't been baptized in order to have those sins forgiven, then you're still lost in your sins. You haven't been added to the church, and you're not saved, and there is no greater priority that you should have in your life than to change that. And if you, didn't, if you didn't take advantage of the opportunity that you had just a few moments ago at the close of worship, when we get done here, or really even before we get done, if you want to become a Christian, let's change that. Let's take care of that. You know, but sometimes we fall into the trap that we've got time, right? I mean, I'm only 42 years old. I should have a good 40 years left. Isn't that true? Isn't that how we think? That's what I hope anyway. But you know what? I may not last till tomorrow. There are people I went to high school with who didn't even make it to college before they died. There are people that I went to college with. In fact, a, a good friend of mine who was a missionary in India had a wife and, and three children. He died in India complications to diabetes that he didn't even know he had. In Matthew 24 and verse 44, Jesus says, For this reason you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming when you do not think he will. I don't know how much longer I have in this life, and I don't know when Jesus is coming back. And a, 
But brethren, if we think we have enough time and we can just postpone it and do it tomorrow, we may be tragically surprised. So don't wait. Maybe you think you're good enough. But you know what? You're not. None of us are. Romans 3 and verse 23, Paul says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And He says again in Romans 6 and verse 23, The wages of sin are death. Everyone in this room, except that little baby back there, has earned death because we've all sinned. And so if you're not a Christian, you've not been forgiven of those sins, and you need to change that. Because just like me, you're not good enough to make it into heaven on your own. But maybe you are a Christian. And so the question when we're talking about restoring our personal relationship to Jesus Christ, maybe the question we should ask ourselves if we are a Christian is, am I walking in the light? We may think we are, but if you look with me in 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, John writes that if we say that we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. It's imperative, brethren, that we walk in the light and we don't walk in darkness. What does that mean? Walking in the light means having a lifestyle characterized by obedience to God. I don't walk in the light just because I was baptized. I walk in the light because I was baptized and I make the choice to do all that I can to do what Jesus has told me to do. It doesn't mean I'm perfect in it, but it means my life is characterized by an attitude of obedience to Him. In 1 John chapter 2, and verse 3, he says, By this we, we know that we have come to know Him, if we keep His commandments. And in verse 6, John writes, the one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner in which he himself walked. You see, we've got to keep the Lord's commandments. We look in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. And Paul says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. You see, before we became Christians, there were certain actions in life or certain lifestyles that we participated in, but after we became a Christian, what happened? We stopped doing those things. Such were some of you. But what happened? Well, you were washed. You were baptized. You were sanctified. You were set apart to be holy to God. You were justified. You were made as if you had never sinned by the blood of Jesus. And so what do we do now? Well, we don't walk that way anymore. We do what God has told us to do. Paul says it in Galatians 5 and verse 24 that we put to death the deeds of the body. But what do we think sometimes as Christians? We think, well, we're good enough. We've got it covered. We don't do any of the major things wrong, right? We, we, we come to worship, and so we punched our, our, our time card here, so we get credit for that. And we haven't done any big things wrong, right? We, we, we haven't killed anybody we, we haven't embezzled millions of dollars. We, we've, we've not tried to harm anybody. We're, we're good people. But we really haven't analyzed whether or not we're walking in the light. See, what do we do at work when our boss says, Hey, Will, did you take care of such and such? Or, Will, have you started working on this and this? And I say, Oh, I forgot about that. But what I tell my boss is, Oh, yeah, boss, I got it all done. I'm ready to go. What do I do when brother or sister so-and-so here in the church get under my skin? And I feel like, well, I've got to tell some folks about what they've done to me. You see, 
lies are still wrong. Lies are still sins even after we're baptized. Lies are not walking in the light. Gossip's not walking in the light. Sowing division is not walking in the light. See, if we're to restore first things first in our lives, we have to make sure that we have restored our personal relationship to Jesus. We need to make sure that we're a Christian and that as a Christian, we're walking in the light. But secondly, not only do we need to restore our personal relationship to Jesus, if we're to restore first things first in our lives, we need to restore our devotion to Jesus. It's, it's wonderful to be a Christian. It's wonderful to walk in the light. But we need to be devoted to Christ too. What about our prayer life? If you're anything like me, you go through your day and you go to sleep and then maybe as you're drifting off or maybe a couple days later you realize, you know what, I've not prayed. I've not prayed in a while. I didn't pray all day. I haven't prayed in a few days. Prayer is us talking with God. Paul says in Philippians 4 and verse 6, Be anxious for nothing but in everything with prayer and supplication. Let your requests be made known to God. Prayer is us taking our wants and our needs, our, our hurts and our fears to God and asking for help. When we look at the early church, we see prayer was very important to them. In Acts 2 and verse 42, uh, Luke writes that they were continually, continually, the early church that is, was continually devoting themselves to the teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread. And to prayer. They couldn't get enough of prayer. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17, Paul talks about when we should pray. And he says, without ceasing. Our life should be characterized by prayer. It doesn't mean our life's one big, long prayer, but it means we should be praying all the time for every circumstance. In Ephesians 6 and verse 18, Paul says, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times. In the Spirit. And yet, what do we sometimes find ourselves doing? Forgetting about prayer. Going through life as if prayer doesn't even exist. I don't mean it's an intentional forgetting, but because there's so many other things to do in life. There's, there's work to do in our jobs. There's a, a honey-do list uh, to do when I get home that never quite seems to get done. And I wonder how that is. I don't know because I work so hard on that honeydew list. But it never quite seems to get finished. There always seems to be more and more. And then there's school activities that my children are involved in and, and uh, sports activities that they're involved in. And then there's TV that just has to be watched, doesn't it? And there's social media that I just have to uh, be a part in. And then there's other things that I want to do. And prayer just tends to be shut out. But you know, every day God does so many wonderful things for me. Shouldn't I take five minutes just to thank Him for a few of those every day? You look in Luke 17, uh, verses 11 through 19. Jesus tells ten lepers, go and show yourself to the priest. And as they're going, they're healed of their leper. Wonderful, kind miracle. And then only one of those ten has the forethought and the wherewithal to turn around and go thank Jesus. And how often are we like the other nine? God blesses us in so many ways every day and we don't even take five minutes to turn around and thank Him in prayer. What about help? I don't know about you, but I need lots of help from God. Uh, I need help every day from God in, in a variety uh, of things that might occur uh, to me uh, during the day. James says in James 5 and verse 13, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. He says in verse 16, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. And yet what do I tend to do? <clears throat> When I get thrown a curveball at work, boy, I 
I don't go to God in prayer about it. What I do is, I can't believe that happened to me, and I spend about 15 minutes feeling sorry for myself, and then I may go to the office next door and spend another 15 minutes telling him about what a rotten day this has been, and then uh, if my wife is unlucky, I may call her and interrupt her day and say, you will not believe what happened to me. And then I spend the rest of the day just stewing about it, and then I go home and I get distracted by all the other things, and what happens? I've not talked to God one bit about the help that I need from Him. Well, what about forgiveness? I need forgiveness. I commit my fair share of sins. In 1 John 1 and verse 9, John writes that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us from all unrighteousness. Well, what do I do? Sometimes the way I treat asking God for forgiveness in prayer is if it's just a foregone conclusion. I don't even bother to stop and pray about the things that I've done wrong, the things I need to do better in life, the ways I need to be more like Him. I just go on about life day after day without even talking to Him about it as if it's just a foregone conclusion that God's going to uh, be fine with it. And I don't humbly approach Him in, in a repenting attitude. And what about adoration? Jesus says in Matthew 6 and verse 9, Pray then in this way, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. There's really only one being in existence that deserves praise and adoration. The being that created the entire universe. The being that sent his only son to die for our sins so that we would have an opportunity to go to heaven. A, a, a being that has promised to take us there if we'll just obey Him. Doesn't He deserve a few moments of our time every day to praise Him for all that He's done? See, I need to restore my devotion to Jesus Christ in prayer, but I also need to restore my devotion to Jesus in study. Prayer is us talking to God. Study, if you will, or reading the Bible, is God talking to us. In John 8, 31 and 32... Jesus says, if you abide in my word, then you're truly my disciples and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. I keep coming back to this, but it's just because I guess uh, it's an epiphany I've had recently, but I can't hardly turn on the news anymore before I have to turn it right off. When I was a boy, it seemed like you watched the news and you could count on what was being said being the truth, the straightforward truth. Now, I don't know if that was the case or not, but at least that was my attitude toward it. Now, when I watch the news, I wonder, well, what's their angle? Is that really accurate what they're saying? How are they trying to spin this to get me to do what they want me to do? And in this sea of falsehood and uncertainty about what's right and what's wrong, what's true and what's false. Isn't it wonderful that I can go to this book for the truth? That if I open the pages of this book, I don't have to doubt what I read in there. It is true. In Psalm 119, 109, the Bible says, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. This world is dark. And I can't figure out how to get through this life and into the life to come without this book that illuminates the darkness. That's the only way I know how to navigate this. But what do I end up doing? Because I've got all these wonderful things in life that can distract me from my attention, that, that can upset my priorities. Do I take 30 minutes a day just to read the Bible? Do I do any kind of daily Bible reading and let God talk to me? All too often, I'm a preacher, brethren, and all too often my daily Bible reading gets skipped. That's not good. What about doctrinal studies? I was talking with two of your members uh, last night, and they were telling me about a study that they had had recently, and I was so impressed because they were a answering the questions that this man had. What about us? Somebody says, why don't you guys use instruments of music? Can we open up the Bible because we've studied it and show them why? What about uh, some of the things Brother Lockhart was uh, talking about in his lesson? Can we show them why uh, we believe in male spiritual leadership? Can we show them why we think 
the church should be organized with elders and deacons? Can we show them why we take the Lord's Supper on the first day of every week? If we don't study the, the book, we can't. Do we even know why we believe what we believe? And what about devotional studies? Studies that are designed to encourage us and strengthen us. Do we participate in those? Have you ever been uh, driving down the road and you realize you haven't seen a speed limit sign in a while? And you start getting a little nervous because you're not sure... Well, the last sign you remember seeing was 55, but you're not sure if this section, maybe it's 45, maybe it's still 55, maybe it's 65. You might have been going 5 or 10 over to begin with, so you start getting really nervous. And you start looking around. You may even ask your wife, uh, can you try and help me find a speed limit sign? Or did you see a speed limit sign? Why are you nervous? Because you don't know what the law is right there. If you knew what the law is, you knew how fast you could go. Well, brethren, if I don't study this book, I don't know the law of God. It makes me nervous because I don't know if I'm doing right or if I'm doing wrong. If I'm going to restore first things first in my life, I have to restore my devotion to Jesus in study, in the study of His Word that will save my soul. Acts 20 and verse 32 but also I need to restore my devotion to Jesus Christ <clears throat> in worship. Once again, in Acts 2 and verse 42, we find that they were continually, the early church, continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They were worshiping all the time. In Hebrews 10 and verse 24, we're told to stimulate one another to love and good works. And then in verse 25, we're told how to do it not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Brethren, God's done a lot for me. A lot for me, and I know He's done a lot for you. And He hasn't asked much of us in return. I remember, uh, for whatever it's worth to you, when I was in college and high school, I loved to go to concerts. I just had a really great time watching live music of, of, of uh, the bands and the musicians that, that I enjoyed. One of my favorites uh, was uh, Eric Clapton, and he's probably about 800 years old by now. Uh, he, he wasn't really from my generation, but I just loved his music, uh, amongst others. And I remember that when I was in college, he was coming to uh, uh, have a concert and... I was so excited and I was going to buy tickets and then I found out that his concert was on Sunday. Well, I can't do it. So I was talking to a friend of mine and he was saying, well, Will, what's the big deal? God's not going to care if we just miss one Sunday. Well, I see his point, but you know what? If I had given my son for you so that you could live and then you didn't even show up at the funeral, I'd be a little upset. And every Sunday, we celebrate what Jesus did for us in the Lord's Supper. And while maybe going to a concert or hunting or fishing or football games or whatever the activity may be is not bad in and of itself, and while I may be able to say, well, God's not going to care about that if I do it, you know what? He just might. Because he gave his most precious possession for you and me. And if we can, he wants us to be here to worship him and to remember that sacrifice that was made. It's so important, brethren. That sacrifice is what allows us to have eternal life. It's so important. If we're to restore first things first in our lives, brethren, we need to restore not just our personal relationship with Jesus, but our, also our devotion to Jesus in uh, prayer and study and in worship. But thirdly, brethren, we also need to restore our enthusiasm for the work of Jesus Christ. I was talking with Brother Jenkins yesterday. We were talking about how the Lord has given just one job when you boil it all down to His church, and that's to get people to heaven. 
That's our job. That's the one duty that we have. Jesus says in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That's our job, is to make disciples. Jesus even tells us how to do it. We baptize them first, and then we teach them everything that uh, Jesus wants them to know, everything that's in the Bible. And yet all too often do we shirk our responsibility for evangelism? Do we shirk our responsibility to tell the lost about Jesus? Because we've got all these other things that distract us, all these other things we're engaged in, and we can't even walk across the street, or we don't, because we're too busy. We don't walk across the street and tell our neighbors about Jesus. We don't walk to the cubicle next to ours. We don't even open our mouth and tell our co-worker, our friend, about Jesus. In Matthew 25, uh, verses 14 through 30, Jesus uh, tells the parable of the talents. A talent was a unit of money uh, in the first century, and uh, uh, a man had quite a bit of wealth, and he was going to go on a journey, and he wanted his wealth to increase while he was gone. And so he called three of his servants to him, and he, based on their individual abilities to handle the amount of money he, he gives them, he gives them differing amounts of money. He gives one five talents of money because he had the ability to handle five talents of money. He gives another one two talents of money and then the third one one talent of money. And the expectation is that they use these. See, the, the talents don't represent abilities that we've been given by God. They represent opportunities to use the abilities that we've been given by God. And so to the five-talent man or the five-talent servant, he gave the opportunity to use five talents to increase the master's wealth. And same with the two-talent man and the one-talent man. And those five talent, that five-talent man took the opportunity to utilize five talents, and what did he do? He took the ball and ran with it, so to speak, and he increased his master's wealth. He gained five more. So now he not only had the ability to utilize five talents, he had the ability to utilize ten and the opportunity to do so. His ability and opportunity increased. And same with the two-talent man. But what did the one-talent man do? He took that talent that he had the ability to use, and because he had it in his hand, he had the opportunity to use it, and he went and he buried it in the ground. So how are we? What are we like? Are we like the five-talent man and the two-talent man who have prioritized the work of the kingdom? Do we take our five talents, our opportunity, if you will, and walk across the street and talk to our neighbor? Or are we like the one-talent man and we keep our talent to ourselves, so to speak, our opportunity to ourselves? I've often wondered if an entire congregation of people were really motivated to take the gospel to the lost and felt a personal responsibility to do so, I have often wondered what would happen to the local church in just a year's time. I mean, think about it this way. If every person in this room set as their goal, put in their mind or wrote down on a piece of paper one person or one family that they were going to try and bring the gospel to in one year's time. And every week they tried to do, make a little more progress and a little more progress to do that. If everybody resolved to try and bring one person in their life to Christ, what this church would look like in one year's time. That's not asking the moon that's something every single one of us is capable of doing, just bringing one person to Jesus. And if everybody did that and was successful at it, this church could not contain its members, at least this building, I should say, could not contain its members in one year's time. And what a wonderful problem that would be to give your elders, wouldn't it? 
Brethren, we live in a world that is full of distractions. And I don't think anybody's going to dispute me on that. It is full of distractions. I mean, the pregame show for the NFL. I find myself wanting to watch people tell me who they think will win. What good is that? My children watch videos of people playing video games. And those are popular with children. When I was a kid, that was called being the guy who got the short end of the stick because you weren't the one playing the game. We spend more time doing things that really aren't necessary, really are frivolous. They're not bad. But if we're to restore first things first in our lives, we need to restore our individual personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're not a Christian... Become one. There's nothing more important than that. If you are a Christian, make sure that you're walking in the light. But in addition to restoring our personal relationship, we need to also restore our devotion to Jesus. Don't neglect prayer. The pregame football show is not more important than prayer. Don't neglect Bible study. Unless we know what God wants us to do, we don't know if we're doing it. And don't neglect worship. There are a number of wonderful things to do in this life, but none is more important than worshiping with our brethren and remembering the sacrifice of Jesus. And we also need to restore our zeal and our enthusiasm for the work that Jesus gave us to do. Jesus has given us one job, and that's to bring people to heaven. And so let's all put that as a priority in our life too. To go across the street, tell people about Jesus, to talk to our friends, to talk to our co-workers about Jesus so that they can be saved too. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak uh, to you all. And, and uh, we will uh, hopefully see one another again in the not, not too distant future.